little less than a year ago, if you had told me that Johnny Haynes would be working full-time as a waiter at the prestigious Boca Royale Country Club in Inglewood, Florida, plus working part-time at the Sable Trace Country Club in exchange for free golfing privileges, plus competing and often winning in weekly quota games against seasoned players like golf pro Ron Ferris, plus on top of all that, hitting the course every day in his spare time to fine-tune his already impeccable low to mid-70s average in the hope of one day making it to the U.S. Open, I would have told you you were crazy. Because at that time, I honestly didn't believe that my little brother was going to make it to his 40th birthday. Well, I met John almost seven years ago playing golf on a golf course. He uh, came up to me and asked if he could join playing, and ever since then, uh, he's been my best friend. Uh, I've seen uh, John come from on top of the world to the bottom of the world and uh, his drive and determination for uh, recovery and, and becoming a professional golfer is unlike any I've ever seen. 35 now, Johnny got his first taste of golf back in high school when he joined the Lemon Bay High School golf team. From that moment on he was hooked. His passion for golf really took off when he went to work for golf legend Arnold Palmer at the Bay Hill Club and Lodge in Orlando, Florida. His passion for golf and his natural talent for the game could have easily landed him a position as golf pro, either there or maybe at some other country club, if he had just kept at it a little while longer. But the onset of drug addiction, complicated by a bipolar condition he never knew he had, brought all that to an end. Johnny began to drift from job to job. A warm and personable young man, he was always a natural at dealing with customers. So he always took jobs that allowed him to deal directly with people, like waiting tables in restaurants. Then, for a while, Johnny hit pay dirt when he found his niche in buying and selling land in Florida. His likability and his gift for gab made him a natural as a broker between those wanting to sell land and those wanting to buy it. For several years, he raked in enough of an income to easily set aside a nice nest egg for any hard times that might come. But the drugs and the lavish lifestyle he treated himself to, in all likelihood to drown out the depression and the feeling of self-loathing that comes with drug addiction, drained his finances as quickly as they came in. And when the housing market collapsed in 2007, he saw his cash machine sputter and die with absolutely no savings to fall back on. Once again, he found himself drifting from job to job and moving from home to home. He moved back to his hometown of Englewood, hoping that the small town environment and the help of his family would straighten him out and get his life back on track. But even in the small town of Englewood, the drug problems eventually came back again. This time in the form of prescription painkillers he had taken to deal with excruciating pain from health issues. He sought medical help to beat the painkiller addiction, only to become even more addicted to the methadone he was put on to wean him from it. Then he lost yet another job as a waiter at the Olive Garden in Port Charlotte. Forced to go on unemployment and caught in a cycle that he didn't think was ever going to end, Johnny slipped deeper and deeper into depression and withdrew from family and friends. Often sitting alone in his apartment, in the dark, with nothing but his own troubled thoughts to keep him company. It was a recipe for potential suicide if there ever was one. But Johnny's faith in God kept him going and kept his head above water just long enough to get him to the point of desperation where he reached out for help. November 13th, 2011. I'll never forget that day for the rest of my life. Um, I was laying in bed, dope sick, roaches running on the floor. I was 130 pounds, horrible living environment, living with other using addicts. Um, arms red with scars from needles. I was uh, in total despair. And uh, I need, I, I, I just thought to myself, it's not that I hit rock bottom, it's that I stopped, I, I wanted to stop digging. And um, you know, I prayed out to God for help. And he gave me a very simple answer. I needed rehab. Well, here I was thinking the whole time, oh, my addiction is telling me re rehab is horrible. It's a horrible place to be. You know, they'll, they'll treat you terribly. They'll throw you in a room and lock the, and throw away the key and let you just squirm. Well, that was not the case. I called my father and uh, the night before and asked him to be there the next morning at 10:30. I was ready to go, no matter what the case was. And he picked me up, and took me to uh, Charlotte Behavioral Center, 
I've never seen a tear in my dad's eye. He's tough as nails. And that day I saw a tear come out of his eyes because he knew my drug problem and I was finally seeking help. And um, going through those doors was like a warm blanket had been tucked over me. Um, they treated me wonderful. Rehab is a great place to be. Uh, they gave me the proper medication uh, to get off of the uh, wean off of the drugs. I did not go through any withdrawals. I met wonderful people. I never knew what NA was at that point until I find out what NA means. Um, it's a program that I got into um, in that uh, rehab. I met some great people once again, and uh, when I had gotten out, I felt like a new man. Since his release from drug rehab, one thing that Johnny has learned is that drug recovery is a day-by-day -day process and that the best thing a recovering addict can do is have something in life to focus on, a dream to chase after. Everybody has something in life that they're passionate about. For Johnny, it's golf. His eyes light up every time he talks about golf legends like Francis Wimette or Bobby Jones. But if you were to ask Johnny which golf player has been his greatest inspiration in life? Well, I would definitely have to say Harry Park. Um, you know, one of the things that stuck out with me most is, uh, you know, what he, one of his uh, quotes uh, was the difference between fantasy and reality is backbreaking work. And, um, you know, that, that really stuck with me. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of others, uh, you know, the quotes that he's made. Um, saying that uh, you know it's you know it's essential to pursue perfection um, but uh, deadly to demand perfection and uh, also um, the fact is is that don't uh, you know don't feel uh, about the possibility of defeat um, because then you become too anxious to lose your sense of freestyle my goal in this whole thing is is to make it to the tryouts you know to the two handicap to get to the trial to the US Open right now I'm at about a I'm at about a four, and uh, you know, half shot, you know, uh, 68, 69. I've been able to do that and put that together. Uh, but I have a great coach, Peggy Kirsch. Um, you know, she's uh, she's done you know wonders for me. Um, we continue to work together. The wonderful thing about the Open is that uh, you know it's open to anybody. Um, it doesn't matter you know who you are. If you're good enough at golf, you can make it. Whether he is at work or on the golf course. Wherever he goes, Johnny always seems to make quite an impression on the people he meets. Hello, my name is Monty Burns. I'm vice president for a major window and door uh, company for the southeast U.S. And I met Mr. Haynes a while back. And over the course of an hour in conversation, uh, one of the things that I quickly picked up on was that he's very charismatic. He has the ability to engage in conversations and make friends very quickly. And he definitely has the ability to bring in a crowd. Uh, everyone that was around us during those conversations was attentive and listened to what he had to say, and he was able to engage multiple people. So uh, really impressed with him uh, just for that short time that I met him. When John and I met, he said, Peggy, I'm a recovering drug addict. Let me have my passion for golf be something that we can do together. And so I said, well, I love golf. I have a passion for it. Let's take it from here. And we've just worked together. He's, he's got a lot, a lot of potential. Um, I told him he had to get to a two handicap before he could qualify for an open. Uh, I'd love for him to get lower. And he loves it and he's getting better every day. And I'm so proud of him. Uh, he uses the game not only as a recreational sport but also to help it's a, it's a tool that helps him in his uh, um, development and golf and actually keeps him out of trouble I, I know he was in some sort of trouble with uh, drugs and so on and uh, this helps him quite a bit and uh, we just appreciate him playing and, and helping out at the course he does a lot for the course he's a great player and I know he's busy he works here plus he works at a restaurant uh, waiting on tables and so on uh, great kid. The thing that I like most about Johnny is that even though he's made some mistakes in life, as we all have, he doesn't 
make excuses for himself. He doesn't try to blame anyone. He totally and unconditionally accepts responsibility for the things that have happened to him in life. And that's so important for someone on the road to recovery. I think he's going to make it. I really do. I think he's going to make it to the U.S. Open someday. He certainly has the drive and the tenacity and the skills to do it. His greatest hope is to make it there by next year. Because as every golf fanatic knows, that's the 100-year anniversary of Francis Wimet being the first amateur to win the U.S. Open against the two golf titans, Harry Varden and Ted Ray. A story that was wonderfully told in Bill Paxton's absolutely perfect movie, The Greatest Game Ever Played, which starred Shia LaBeouf in the most moving and memorable performance of his career. But even if he doesn't make the 2013 Open, He'll try again next year, and the next year, as long as it takes. He's learning to ignore those inner demons that almost destroyed him once. You know, those little voices we all hear in our head from time to time that whisper things like, forget it, pal, you don't have what it takes. Or, if you haven't made it by now, you're never going to make it. You have to ignore those voices and keep plugging on, day by day, for as long as it takes. Sure, there'll be naysayers. People will say it's a long shot. But isn't that what most dreams are? Long shots? Besides, it's not just about him anymore. It's also about trying to be an inspiration for others who are struggling with addiction and turning them into an army of dream chasers, one at a time. Like Matt, a friend and former neighbor of Johnny's also recovering from drug addiction, who dreams of one day being a charter boat captain. Johnny's attitude of, if I can do this, then you, my friend, can certainly do this too, has really impacted Matt's life. You know, when you don't have those hopes and dreams, you go right into depression, isolation, and right back to drugs again. Who knows what the future holds for my brother? The same thing that it holds for the rest of us, I guess. The promise that if you look forward to the potential tomorrow may bring, while remembering to savor each day just as it comes, one at a time, then the dream that you are chasing will never be more than a day away.